Long before the church had pulpits and play spaces, she had dinner tables and kitchens. Every meal mattered and Jesus pointed the way. Everyone was welcome when Jesus sat at a table. From VIPs to traitors, from religious leaders to shame-filled sinners, from those in the margins to those at the top, he ate with them all. And every meal became a peek into his new ways of living and new ways of loving. After all, why did Jesus come? He came to serve, to give his life, and to seek and save the lost. And how did he come? He came eating and drinking. What we learn at the table with Jesus is what we need for our tables today. Hey, this is the last message in our At the Table with Jesus teaching series. So in celebration of all the meals we've discussed the last few months, I, I want I want to start by asking you to bring to mind a favorite meal, not, not the food, not the steak or coffee or whatever it is for you, but the meal, the event. For example, I remember breakfast with my grandpa, big grandpa. We had big grandma and grandpa, little grandma and grandpa out in his trailer before I'd leave for for school. I don't know, I was probably around 10 years old and and breakfast with grandpa consisted of coffee with sugar cubes, or I don't know, it might have been sugar cubes with coffee. Toast with choke, bear, choke cherry jelly, and, and every once in a while, he'd reach into his little refrigerator and ask me if I, I wanted any pickled pig's brain or blood sausage. Pretty much always said no to that, but I loved breakfast with my grandpa. He told the best stories. I remember camping with my family at Bald Eagle. Actually, we stayed in a yurt. It was our version of camping. It was Father's Day. We grilled T-bone steaks over an open fire, potatoes wrapped in tinfoil, and, and then just sat around the fire and ate and talked and looked at the stars. I remember our, our family sharing a Christmas meal at an orphanage in Myanmar, one of the first times we went. I don't remember the menu at all. Most of it was stuff that I wouldn't order in a restaurant. It certainly wasn't Christmas food, but... And I was just overwhelmed by those serving us, people who had so little, but they were giving us their very best. Of course, I I have some meal memories I'd like to forget. Like when I forced my son Jake to eat one stinking kernel of corn. He kept telling me he'd throw up. I knew he was exaggerating, so I made him eat one kernel of corn. He was not not exaggerating. His last time he ate corn, his last time I asked him to eat corn, which is okay because it's not, it's really not about the food. It's about the people. It's about conversation and laughter around the table with family and friends. It's about the people around the table. Now, most Bible scholars, theologians, and pastors miss this because we spiritualize everything and sometimes we are so stinking serious. But can I tell you something? I hope you got out of this series that Jesus loved to eat. He, he loved a good meal around the table with friends. He was always going out to dinner, cooking meals for his friends, creating wine for a wedding, food for a crowd, and, and not just enough food to get by. So much food, there were baskets filled with leftovers. In fact, religious leaders often complained about Jesus and his meals. This man, they said, this man calls himself religious, but he eats his meals with sinners. In fact, he acts like a partier. So it should be no surprise that on occasion, Jesus would say that the kingdom of heaven is like a meal. It's like a banquet, a wedding feast. And in fact, in the last book of the New Testament, the book of the revelation of Jesus, we find that heaven is like a party, a huge celebration meal, a wedding feast. John writes in Revelation 19 verses 6 through 7, then I heard again what sounded like the the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. We tend to have these really boring images of heaven, like puffy white clouds and angels with harps and everyone dressed in white, like the ultimate retirement village or a never-ending golf game. (laughs) Perhaps somewhere along the line, you heard that heaven is just this great big never-ending worship service, and you thought, that's the good news? But Jesus smashes all the misconceptions. Forget harps and halos. Think think heaven on earth. The kingdom of heaven is like a party with a great family gathered around a full table. And I I know some of you are thinking, heaven on earth is the last thing I imagine when I sit down at the table with my family. My son's making faces at the food. My daughter's throwing it on the floor. I have to use all my persuasive powers of the ages to get anyone to take a bite. This is not heaven on earth. 
And when the fight erupts at Thanksgiving over politics or religion or sports, I'm not thinking, I hope this lasts forever. But you know, sometimes even the battles around the table are a reminder of what our hearts are missing, that every table can be sacred space, that every meal can become an encounter with Jesus. At the table with Jesus, it's not just an historical study, it's a present moment invitation. There's always room at the table of God for another seat. That's the hospitality heart of God. There's always room. God says there will always be room for one more seat at my table. So listen, before we dive in deeper, just listen. Some of you, God brought you to this moment right now just to hear those two words. There's always room. Don't care what you've done, who you are, who others say you are, who you think you are, how far away from God it seems like you've gone. There's always room in his house, at his table, for his family. In fact, the theme of our scripture for this teaching, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is all about the seat we have at his table. We have a seat at the table of God, the table in heaven. In, in fact, we are all so welcome to his table that he doesn't stop with supper. He, he adopts us into his family. Now, while the hospitality heart of God has always been for us, we haven't always been with him. And And that's actually where Ephesians chapter 2 starts. It's life before the table, before his table. It's our life before the table that, that makes the invitation all are welcome so incredible. See, before I had a seat at the table, Paul says that before I had a seat at the table with Jesus, the table of God, I was dead and doomed and full of sin and an enemy of God. Look at his, look at his words in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way, following the passions and and the desires of our evil nature. Now, we, we like to label people, don't we? We, we kind of like to distinguish ourselves and our tribe even from others. Sometimes we become so focused on our own tribe that we begin to think that our team is the only team that matters. Only two kinds of people in the world, right? You, you've heard that before. That's, that's setting everybody else off. That, there's only two kinds of people in the world, us and those that don't really matter. Two kinds of people, those who love getting up in the morning and those who hate those who love getting up in the morning. Only two kinds of people in the world, those who who voted for Biden and those who voted for Trump, those who agree with my lifestyle and those who hate me. So many labels we use, Republican, Democrat, African-American, charismatic, immigrant, orphan, pro-life, gay, married, single, gender fluid, and my personal favorite, old white male. (laughs) But in Ephesians 2, Paul actually suggests that every label that we could ever use is a temporary less than important distinction in comparison to two labels, living or dead. Once you were dead, Paul says, doomed forever because of your many sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. (laughs) He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature under God's anger, just like everyone else, Paul says. If if you're a Christ follower, this is what you once were. Whisper this to yourself, wherever you're sitting, before the table, I was dead and doomed. Before the table, I was dead and doomed. But this is so amazing. All are welcome, even the dead and doomed. (laughs) Before the table, I was dead and doomed. Now, this runs counter to what we believe, but it aligns with what we experience. In the physical world, we're born, we live, and then we die. But in the spiritual reality, we're born dead. In fact, in, in Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 through 27, God diagnoses the condition of our soul, our heart, apart from a connection with him. And, and he, he basically says, you're, you're dead. You need a new heart. You, you have a heart of stone, but you were created for a heart of flesh. You need a new heart. You know what? Some of us will breathe our way from birth to death without ever finding life. And not only were we dead... <laughs> We were doomed. What a word, right? 
That, that word, it means inevitable destruction or ruin, de- destined to an unhappy ending. Paul says that we were doomed forever because we were full of sin. Before the table, I was full of sin. But this is so amazing. Everyone's welcome. All are welcome, even those full of sin. Are you full of sin? I realize it's not culturally correct to even talk about sin, at least not my own sin. I might call out someone else, but I'm not full of sin. Surely I'm not under the control line. But we don't usually start at out of control. It starts with an innocent lie. It got you out of trouble, but a decade later, you've told so many lies, you've lost track of reality. Or, or it starts with a little hate or a little pornography or just a little apathy or, or just a bit of selfishness that treats others as a means to an end. But, but then it grows and it will grow. And as it grows, it's writing an unhappy ending to your story. Now, does that mean that people without Jesus can only do evil? Of course not. It is so amazing. Each person, each and every person in the world is created in the image of God. And because of that, we all have a capacity for goodness and kindness and love. But sooner or later, the sin is going to spill out. I don't know if you remember Oscar Schindler, he was the hero of Schindler's List. If you ever read the book or saw the movie, he, he risked his life during World War II to rescue and deliver Jews from the Holocaust. He saved 1,200 Polish Jews. After the war, he abandoned his wife, became a womanizer and an alcoholic, lost everything. In fact, one night for some schnapps, he pawned the gold ring that those he rescued had formed from their false teeth. Why? Because apart from Christ, sooner or later, the sin that we're full of is going to spill out. We're dead and we're doomed, Paul says, living out the desires of our evil nature, followers of Satan, ignoring God and refusing to obey him. We're under his anger, enemies of God. Man, it is a dark description, but it's also the reality of life without Christ. See, without the inbreaking life that comes when heaven meets earth, there's, there's only death and doom. Once you were. For some of us, those words are not past tense. They read, and now you are. And now you are. And now you are dead and doomed, full of sin, an enemy of God. But, but listen again, that's what's so amazing. All are welcome, even as enemies. Even as enemies. And, and if Paul's words have any truth to them, if they accurately describe the reality of the spiritual world, the enemies of God, they're all around us. The dead and the doom, full of sin, refusing to follow God, people living life in the dark, they're, they're all around us. And they are so very welcome at his table. I mean, think about it. For decades, we've criticized, condemned, and judged our neighbors who are living in the dark doom, dead to the amazing goodness of God. We've told our kids, don't be like them, which easily translated into don't like them. I mean, over the course of the years, rather than loving our neighbors, we ignored them, blocked them out. They became strangers, not to be trusted. That's what we teach our kids, right? Stranger danger. But Paul's words come to us and and he's not talking about the dead people around us. He's talking to us about us. He's talking to us about us when he says, once you all were dead because of your sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, impressed by Satan, ignoring God. All of us used to live that way. He said, born with the evil way in us, just like everyone else. If there is anyone, listen to me, if there is anyone in the world who should be loving the dead to life, it's those who used to be there. And, and I don't know, I, I think sometimes we find it unusually easy to forget that we were just like everyone else. On the outside of life, until we were invited to the table by heaven's hospitality. See, even though Paul's words in verses 1 through 3 are so hard, so dark, so difficult, what we're going to find is that truly his focus, his theme, the heart of what he's saying is not the darkness that once filled our hearts. He's focused on the life that we now find in Christ. If we've responded to the invitation of God, once upon a time we were dead, doomed, full of sin and enemies of God, but the hospitality heart of God invited us in. Look at Ephesians 2 verses 4 through 6. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins he gave us life when he raised christ from the dead it's only by god's special favor that you've been saved 
For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, I got to tell you, some of my favorite verses in the Bible highlight a combination of those two words, but God, but God. Oh, how I love the but of God. <laughs> They're words of hope and redemption, grace and sovereign power. I mean, you should highlight them every time you read them in Scripture, but God. The psalmist going through dark days uttered them in Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart may fail. He said, but God, but God, but God is the strength of my heart. Joan in the belly of a well cried out, I sank down beneath the earth, but you, Lord my God, but you, God, brought my life up from the pit. Jesus was talking about rich people following him when he said, with man, this is impossible. It's impossible for a rich person to follow God, but with God, all things are possible. But God makes all things possible. And then comes Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2. My favorite of the but God passages. You were dead, you were doomed, you were full of sin, but God, but God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much, but God... And those two words are the turning point of my story. They mark the point where God turned my story into his story, the point where, where his hands began to shape my life. Where would we be without but God? I mean, it's so incomprehensible, so utterly wondrous. If there was ever a stranger that would disappoint you, betray or hurt you, it was us. But something happened. The but of God happened. Dan was dead and doomed, but God, who is so rich in mercy, reached out with his heart of hospitality and gave him life. Dan couldn't try hard enough without messing up, was good at lying, struggled so much with selfishness and pride. He hurt others, and, and once or two, once or twice, I actually felt pretty good about doing it. He did not deserve a seat at the table, and neither did you. But God who was so rich in mercy, raised us up, resurrected what was dead, and gave us life. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you what this means? If you were once dead and now you're alive, you didn't do anything to make yourself undead. <laughs> it's all grace. It's all nothing but God. There's no room for pride because you had no partnership in your resurrection. I mean, dead is dead. Can you imagine Jesus going to Lazarus, dead for days in a tomb, and yelling out, now Lazarus, I want to resurrect you from the dead, but I need you to do something first. <laughs> now Jesus just called out to God, and then Lazarus lived. But listen, not only does he give us life, he gave us life, but he also gives us a seat at the table. He gave us life and a seat at his table. Paul says we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, I believe that Paul is imagining a seat at the table, not a seat on the couch or a rocking recliner. Jesus is talking about the victory feast of heaven. He's talking about a seat at the table. You've heard that phrase before, a seat at the table. In an organization, it's all about having a place, finding your voice. Usually when we say we want a seat at the table, it's because we feel that we deserve to be heard. We have a right to lead. We, we want a seat at the table. This is not that kind of table seat. This is not the kind of seat we earn. It's not a seat we buy. It's not a, a place where our, our voice deserves to be heard. It, it's grace. The, this is more like the seat that would have been empty at Lazarus' house, but now is filled because of resurrection. It's that kind of seat. It's like Jesus' story in Luke chapter 14. The kingdom of heaven, he said, is like a, a great banquet, and all those invited had excuses for not coming, so the king sent servants out to bring in the people from the margins the sick and the poor, the, the ones that you never see. And, and he gave them a seat at the table. That's our seat. It's like the seat at the table prepared by the great shepherd in, in Psalm 23. He prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies, in the shadows of the valley of death. It's a seat like the one Mary sat in while Martha worried and labored over having, having things in her home just right. Mary sat at Jesus' feet to just listen to his words, to soak it all in. It's, it's that kind of seat. Listen to Paul's description of our seat, our seat at his table. 
In Ephesians 2, 6 through 7, he writes, For he raised us, God raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. We're in Christ, and so God can always point to us, I love this, God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness towards us, as shown in all that he has done through us, all that he has done for us through Christ Jesus. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Who wouldn't want to be an example of God's favor and kindness? Let me make you an example. I'm going to make you an example of my favor and kindness. You know, there's so many reasons why Christ did what he did to give us new life. He, why Christ went to the cross so that we could have new life. He did it for his glory and for our good. But, but think about this. He could have given us life without giving us a seat at his table. He gave you a seat at his table because he loves you. He, he actually likes you. He likes hanging out with you, your family. I mean, if God has a table, your seat is at it. If God throws a party, your invite is in the mail. That sunset last week, it had your name all over it. And that look in his eyes is, come on and just sit for a bit. Come, just sit for a bit here at the table. You've been running and striving for stuff that you don't need when what you need only I can give you. Come and come and just sit with me for a bit. Be still. Let the light warm you and let my words give you hope. Sit here. You're, you're part of the family. In his book, Connecting, Larry Crabb tells about a friend who had been raised in an angry family. The mills were silent or sarcastically noisy. But he said down the street was this old-fashioned house with a big porch where a happy family lived. Larry's friend told him that when he was about 10 years old, he began excusing himself from his table as soon as he could without being yelled at. And he'd walk down to that old-fashioned house. He'd crawl under the porch and just sit there listening to the sounds of laughter around the table. Larry just asked him to imagine what it would have been like if the father in the house had known he was huddled beneath that porch and sent his son out to invite him in. He asked him to envision accepting that invitation, sitting at the table, accidentally spilling his glass of water and hearing the father roar with laughter and delight, get him more water and a dry shirt. I want him to enjoy the meal. Do you understand you've got a seat at the table? In fact, you've been adopted into the family of God, which means that your table is a table full of blessing. So much so much blessing available. Grace for every failure, peace in every chaotic moment, joy when discouragement knocks, love in the margins, even when you're hard to love, and sometimes we are. Hope for the stuck days and, and purpose, a purpose for living, a mission, a calling for your life. That alone is a great blessing. Listen, you're invited. I, I don't care what you've done or where you've been or how long you've been gone. It's not a distance thing. There is no distance too great for God to close the gap. There is no sin that has filled you up that is beyond his grace to forgive. This is your invitation. Right now, God's inviting you. Jesus is inviting you to the table. His invitation is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, where Paul writes, For by grace, you don't have to earn it, you can't earn it. It's a gift. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. We are God's masterpiece. We are what God does, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You're invited. Especially, let me talk to you, if, if you've never experienced it before, right now at this moment, God is offering you a gift. His gift is, is our invitation to his table. Rosaria Butterfield has written a book that says the gospel comes with a house key. She, she's passionate about hospitality, about the table. She was a tenured professor in women's studies at Syracuse University. She and her partner were members of a Unitarian church where Rosaria was the coordinator of the welcoming committee, a gay and lesbian advocacy group. 
Up to this point in her life, Rosaria said that the only Christians she knew were intellectually impaired, the kind of people who sent me hate mail, she said, or, or carried signs at gay pride marches that read, God hates facts. But her negative image of Christians would radically change when she met a local pastor and his wife, Ken and Floyd. And eventually that friendship led to her seat at Christ's table. Here's how Rosaria describes her first encounter with these Christ followers. She says, I, I remember being conscious of the gay and pro-choice bumper stickers on my car. I remember awkwardly greeting my host at the door and pulling two gifts out of my bag, a bottle of red wine and a box of strong tea. I, I wanted to get to know them, she said, but not at the expense of compromising my identity, my culture, or my values. I I'd come to them through life experience, research, and deep thinking. I liked Ken and Floyd immediately, she said, because they seemed sensitive to that. During our meal, I remember holding my breath and just waiting to be punched in the gut with something I felt was grossly offensive. I, I believed that God was dead, and if he ever was alive, the poverty, violence, racism, sexism, homophobia, and war all around was proof that he didn't care. <laughs> but Ken's God, she wrote. Ken's God seemed alive, three-dimensional, and wise, if firm. And Ken and Floyd were anything but intellectually impaired. Ken and Floyd invited me in, she said. They invited me into their table and their lives, not to scapegoat me, but to listen and learn and dialogue. They entered my world. They met my friends. We, we talked openly about sexuality and politics, and they didn't act as if such conversations were polluting them. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way that I'd never heard. His prayers were intimate and vulnerable. He repented of sins right in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, but full of mercy. <laughs> and I love this. She wrote this. She said, and because Ken and Floyd didn't invite me to church, I knew it was safe to be friends with them. Ken knew I couldn't come to church, so he brought church to me, she said. Over time, she started devouring the Bible, read it all the way through multiple times. She kept talking to Ken and Floyd, and, and then one ordinary day, she accepted God's invitation. She writes, I came to Jesus open-handed and naked. In this war of worldviews, Ken and Floyd were there. The church that had been praying for me for years at this time was there. Jesus triumphed, and I was a broken mess. She said, my conversion was a train wreck. <laughs> I didn't want to lose everything I loved, but the voice of God sang a love song in the rubble of my world. I weakly believed that if Jesus could conquer death, he could make right my world. I drank, she said, tentatively at first, but then passionately, I drank of the solace of the Spirit of God. She responded to God's invitation to come to the table. Perhaps today is your day to respond to his invitation as well. Can you hear him say, come to the table. There's a seat waiting for you, a home, a family. During this last season of life, one of the scriptures that has continuously encouraged me, encouraged me so much, are Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, just a few pages back from Ephesians 2. I especially like it in the Living Bible. Paul writes, Long ago, before God made the world, God chose us to be his very own. Through what Christ would do for us, he decided then to make us holy in his eyes. Without a single fault, we stand before him, covered in his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this, Paul says, he did this, because he wanted to. He, he, didn't, he didn't have to. You are relentlessly loved by the lavish heart of God. This weekend we're celebrating communion and, and, and communion is, is a reminder that but God is so rich in mercy and loves you so much. Communion is an invitation to come to the table. So I wanna lead us in a time of communion, but, but before I do that, if, if this is your time, to respond to the invitation. I just wanna encourage you to just take a moment and talk to Jesus. Tell him whatever's on your heart. 
L- listen, listen for his whisper. Listen for his voice. Listen to the heartbeat. Listen to his love for you. And then tell him, I accept your invitation. I'm ready to leave the dead, doomed, and full of sin life behind. Jesus, I believe you died to give me a seat at the table to seal my adoption. I'm ready to come home. Just take a moment. I'm going to give you a moment of silence before I pray for you. Just talk to Jesus. Now just tell Jesus, give him your own words, but if you don't have the words, let mine direct you. I accept your invitation, Jesus. I'm ready to leave the dead, doomed, and full of sin life behind. Jesus, I believe you died to give me a seat at the table to seal my adoption. I'm ready to come home. Father, I pray for each and every person listening. Whether it's somebody who once upon a time said yes to you and has just walked away, little by little over the course of time, or somebody who's never made a decision to accept your invitation to come to the table. God, or or even if if, if it's somebody who has accepted, but they're not living, they're not living like Your love is pouring out of us now. And whatever it is, I pray that we would would accept your invitation to come to the table. And I pray especially, I pray especially today that, that as we celebrate communion together, whether we're listening alone or in a group, in a gathering, as we celebrate communion together, God, I pray that you would you would remind us that you would impress upon our hearts the amazing gift of mercy and grace and love that you've given to us. That Jesus, when he died on the cross, paid for my sins and and, and signed the adoption papers so that I I would not only have life, I would be I would be seated at the table and not only seated at the table, but but part of the family. We say thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.